Bonjour tout le monde. Good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for being here. Our uh, speaker today for the RQMP seminar is Yao Shen. Uh, Yao is a postdoc at Brookhaven uh, National Lab, where he works uh, with uh, Mark Dean. And today he will talk to us about uh, resonant inelastic X ray scattering um, experiments on uh, nickelates. So, um, Yao, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, hi everyone. I'm very happy to have the chance to uh, present our work on the low Venus nucleus. Uh, I'm Yao Shen, currently a postdoc in uh, Brookhaven National Lab. Uh, so first, I'd like to thank all the collaborators. So the pro especially Mark, so who initiates the project. And then Valentina is a beamline scientist for the instrument we use. And uh, Gilberto is a former group member, and now he is a beamline scientist in Argonne. And the ther theoretical works were done by Mike and uh, Steve. So this is the outline of my talk. So it will be divided into two parts. For the first part, I will focus on the rigs at oxygen cage, trying to figure out the electronic structure of the low variance nucleates. And for the second part, we will switch to the RICS at nickel LH to mainly study the charge order in these materials. And so the reason why we are interested in nucleus, especially the low venous nucleus, is due to the cuprate superconductors. So ever since the discovery of cuprate superconductors, people were wondering if similar unconventional superconductivity can be realized in other materials based on other 3D metals. So the first choice would be nickel since it's just besides the copper. And so there are some uh, theoretical works and uh, clearly there would be difference between copper and the nickel. If you look at it, so here it's a low valence nucleate. So it's nickel one plus instead of two plus, which is more common in materials. So here is a one plus. It has nine 3D electrons, so the same as a copper two plus. But difference is since it's nickel, so it has one photon, a proton less. So what we can expect is that the nuclear attraction for the valence electrons would be weaker for nickel one plus, and uh, as a result, you would have a larger charge transfer energy. So the physical properties would be quite different for nickel one plus. However, in fact, superconductivity is also is finally realized in the low venous nucleus, the infinite layer nucleus in this case, in 2019. And so people were very excited that although there seems to be some difference between nickel one plus and copper two plus, the superconductivity can realize in some uh, somehow. So the first Thing people want to check after the discovery of superconductivity in low venous nucleus is to check if there are some similarity and the differences between cuprate and the nucleus to see which of the properties or which of the features are important for unconventional superconductivity. So we'll briefly go through all these uh, points one by one. So we know that there are different kinds of uh, cuprates, but almost all of them have a layered structure and has a D9 minus delta electronic state in the whole doped cuprates. And for low venous nucleus, the nuclear superconductors, they have the chemical formula as this. The R means rare earth, and the N means there are multiple layers of nickel oxygen. Uh, separated by a rare earth atom. So multiple uh, n layers of nickel oxygen and uh, separated from each other. And different layers will give you different effective whole doping. So for example, if you have n equals three, you will have the 438 and uh, the effective whole doping would be a third for this one. And uh, if you have n equals five, you will have effectively 20% whole doped. And if n is infinite, then it's a so-called infinite layer nuclide. And uh, you can further tune the doping by a uh, real chemical doping, like strontium doping. And then you can have a continuous phase diagram. So in this regard, it is quite similar to the cuprates. 
And uh, if we look at the phase diagram, so the phase diagram for the cuprates are uh, pretty rich. And uh, this is the latest phase diagram for the infinite of the infinite layer nucleate. And uh, if so, in the on the Doppler regime, there is often in the resistivity indicating insulating behavior, which correspond to the antiferromagnetic phase in cuprates. And uh, so here is the superconductivity dome, and uh, we have a linear behavior of the resistivity indicating the strange metal phase. And then in the over Doppler regime, we have a Fermi liquid behavior. So as you can see, although some details might be different, uh, but overall the phase diagram is very similar to cuprates. And this is uh, these are all the uh, superconducting nucleates. And if we put the superconductivity dome of them together, and they almost overlap with each other. And you can also put other members like the N equal to five member. So it's 20% whole dope. And so it just cross the superconductivity dome. And indeed, it is experimentally superconducting. And it, uh, another member, the N equal to three member, is a third doped. So it's in the over doped regime, it's not in the superconducting regime, but it belongs to the same family. So this is a phase diagram. Then for cuprates, we know that near the Fermi level, uh, the, it is dominated by the copper dx squared minus y squared orbitals, which can be inferred from the strong diachronism in X-ray absorption at the copper LH. And the same thing happens to the low valence nucleates, including the trilayer nucleate and the infinite layer nucleate. The strong diachronism also observed, indicating that the nickel dx squared minus y squared orbital is the most important orbitals near the Fermi level. And uh, one of the most important features of cuprates is uh, strong magnetic interactions. The nearest neighbor J can be as large as 140 MeV, which in these materials are caused by the strong correlations. And for nucleates, not a long way from the discovery of superconductivity, Rix uh, observed the nice dispersion of the magnons in both the trilayer nucleate and the infinite layer nucleate, and the nearest neighbor exchange reaction is uh, quite consistent, around 60 or 70 MeV. So it's weaker than cuprates, but still uh, appreciable. So indicating that the corrections in the material in the low valence nucleus are still uh, pretty strong. And then the question would be, if there is a strong hybridization between the transition metal 3D and oxygen 2P orbitals, so we know for cuprates, this is very important. So th this has something to do with the so-called GSA scheme. So if you put delta, the charge transfer energy, which measures the energy difference between the oxygen orbitals and the transition metal orbitals, if you put it as the x-axis and put the onset coulomb interaction U as a y-axis, then you will have a GSA scheme. And there are different uh, phases in this phase diagram. So if delta is much smaller than u, so the low uh, low energy physics is primarily determined by uh, delta. And then you are in the charge transfer regime where if you dope holes, they'll go to the oxygen sites and uh, you can expect uh, very strong super exchange interactions. And if delta is much larger than u, then you are in the whole uh, more hub the regime. And uh, of course, if you dump holes, they will go to the uh, the transition metal side and the super exchange would be uh, very weak in this regime. And if you look carefully, there is the intermediate phase marked as AB in the phase diagram. So that's a mixed charge transfer mod hub the regime. So it's the intermediate phase between the mod hub and the charge transfer. And as you can expect, if you dump holes, they will go to both the transition metal side and the oxygen side. And the super exchange will be somewhere between the charge transfer and what harbored. So we know for the cuprates, they belong to the charge transfer regime with very strong super exchange. Then how about the low valence nucleates? Uh, so some people think they, they're similar to cuprates, so it's in the charge transfer regime. However, other people think the charge transfer energy delta would be much larger for nucleus, so it's in the more hybrid regime. 
Um, and uh, some people think, oh, there, it is not that large. It should be the, somewhere in the intermediate phase. So we'd like to answer this question using RICS at the oxygen cage. So the material we studied is a trilayer nucleate. So it's effectively a third hole doped in the overdoped regime. And it's a single crystal. Uh, we put the H0L in the scattering pan and the RICS experiment uh, were performed at the six beam line at NSAS2 in Brookhaven National Lab. So the reason why we measure at the oxygen cage is that it is very sensitive to uh, where you are in the ZSA scheme. So for example, if you are in the charge transfer regime, uh, the RICS process at the oxygen cage correspond to uh, an electron, the, a core electron absorb a photon and uh, excite to the unoccupied states of the oxygen 2p orbitals. And uh, during the photo emission, another electron from the oxygen 2p orbitals de-excite to fill the core hole. So this is for the charge transfer uh, regime. However, if you in the more harbor regime, then the core electron will be excited to the transition metal 3D orbitals through hybridization. And uh, during the photo emission, another oxygen 2p, uh, an electron from the oxygen 2p orbitals will be de excited to fill the core hole and emit the photon. And uh, of course, if you are in the intermediate phase, the electrons can be excited to both the oxygen 2p and the transition 3D orbitals. So as you can see, whether you are in the charge transfer or mode hub regimes, the RICS process at the oxygen cage would be quite different. And uh, so that the data would be quite different. So, so now let's uh, look at the data. But before we go to the RICS data, first we check the X-ray absorption. So when we measured the nucleate 438, we also measured LICO with a similar hole doping. So it's 0 0.35 hole doped. Uh, it's comparable to a third hole doped nucleate. So for a direct comparison. And in both samples, we observe the well-defined pre-peaks. So what does this mean? So for cuprates, we know that it's in the charge transfer regime. So this peak corresponds to an uh, electron except to the unoccupied states of the octane 2p orbitals. So how about the nucleates? So the very existence of this peak has already excluded the possibility of more hybrid regime, since in that region you won't have the such nice pre-peak. But it doesn't mean it's in the charge transfer region, since in the mixed charge transfer more hybrid region, you can also have the core electrons excited to the oxygen 2p orbitals, and it will give you the pre-peak as well. So to further distinguish between these two scenarios, we need to go to the RICS measurement. And these are the energy maps for the nucleates and the cuprates. So the incident, the incident axis, the axis is, x-axis is the incident energy of the X-ray and the y-axis is the energy loss. And we, we can see multiple features in these so-called energy maps. So the diagonal features are the fluorescence. Now, they can have some information about the band structure, but here we are more interested in the in the features, so-called so Raman-like features, which resonate at the pre-peak position. And again, for cuprates, it's in the charge transfer regime. So these features correspond to oxygen 2p electrons that to fill the core hole. So they are mostly inter-oxygen orbital excitations. So basically there are just a real rearrangement of the occupations of oxygen 2p orbitals. How about the nucleates? So nucleates, they, if you look at it, we have the strong high energy signals and the weak low energy signals. And if we, real, uh, if we analyze it, we will realize that it is in the mixed charge with the remote hub regime. So for the high energy strong signals, they correspond to oxygen 2p electron de excited to fill the core hole. And the low energy features, they are they correspond to the dashed line here. So an uh, electron from the transition 3D orbitals de excited to fill the core hole. And this process is only made up possible through hybridization. 
So it is expected to be much weaker. And indeed, in the energy map, you can see the low energy excitation, they are very weak, much weaker than the high energy ones. And so basically, they are DD excitations. So the rearrangement of the uh, transition metals, 3D orbitals, and the high energy features, these are uh, mixed charge transfer uh, in their oxygen orbital excitations, uh, quite similar to the cuprates here. So these analyses give us the conclusion that the low venous nucleates belong to the mixed charge transfer more turbid region, so in the intermediate phase. And uh, to further confirm this conclusion and give some quantitative uh, results, we make use of the cluster ED calculations. So we construct the two clusters. The cuprate is a copper two oxygen 11 cluster. And uh, for the nickelate, it's a nickel two oxygen seven cluster without apical oxygens. Uh, so in the Hamiltonian, we include all the orbital energies for D and the 3D and the 2P orbitals. So this is a schematic of the uh, orbital distribution, including the crystal field splitting and the charge and energy delta. And then we also include all the hoppings between oxygen, oxygen, and between oxygen and uh, transition metal. And then we also include all the chrome interactions uh, between DD, between PP, and between D and P. And the UQ is the uh, cohort potential. And in the basis, we include all the 3D and the 2P orbitals, construct the Hamiltonian with open boundary uh, in whole language, and uh, calculate the risk cross-section using the kramers hessenberg equation. And we search, uh, search through the parameter space and find a combination of parameters that can well reproduce our results. So the upper panel is the data and the lower panel is the calculations. And uh, you can see they are pretty consistent. And the table gives us the most important parameter that is the crew interaction U and the charge and energy delta. And we also calculate the uh, exchange interaction along with, uh, put it along with the experimental value and we can see they're quite consistent. And then for the cuprates, uh, as expected in, in the charge and energy, so U is much larger than delta which means our approach is uh, worked well. And for low venous nucleates, as you can see, U is comparable to delta. So which means these parameters will put it in the, this position in the DSA scheme. So it is, it is indeed in the intermediate uh, phase. So mixed charge for more hub region of the DSA scheme, uh, confirming our results from the energy map. So here, just uh, I show more calculations along with the data to, uh, to try to convince you that our calculations are, uh, our calculations work pretty well. And the very right panel is a simplified Leibniz field analysis, just uh, showing that we know what's going on during these excitations. So our conclusions indicate that there is there is still strong hybridization between the nickel and the oxygen in low venous nucleates, and that can explain uh, the strong exchange interactions in these materials. And so there is another question left, which is if there is other kinds of orders or symmetry breakings uh, near the superconducted dome. So we know in cuprates, uh, almost in all kinds of cuprate, there is some charge order near the superconductivity dome. They form the, the charge order uh, like this. So it is parallel to the copper oxygen bonds. And in nucleates, in another nucleus, in the high valence nucleus, so here it's nickel two plus instead of nickel one plus. So in high valence nucleus, they also have uh, charge order along with the spin order in the larger portion of the phase diagram. The difference is they form the diagonal strap order. So as you can see, the direction of the strap is diagonal to the nickel oxygen sites. That's nickel oxygen bonds. So this is different from cuprates. So what about the low venous nucleates that we are more interested in here? Actually in the trilayer nucleate 438, 
there has been there are reports about the strap order, which is diagonal to the nickel oxygen sites, as nickel oxygen bonds, which are similar to the high valence nucleates. The difference is in the low valence nucleates, as you can see, the spin or the spin direction is along the C direction, out of plane. And for the high valence nucleates, it's uh, mostly in plane, but tilted up towards the out plane. So that's the difference. Uh, another, another thing to be mentioned is that along with the charge ordering, there is a semiconductor insulator transition at ordinary temperature of around 100 K. Uh, and uh, in another uh, trilayer nucleate, the peridymium one, it, is, uh, it has the same structure, but the relativity shows metallic behavior down to the lowest temperature we can measure, and there is no indication of charge ordering. So the reason why these, uh, these two compounds with the same structure have such different behaviors remain unknown, uh, but maybe it's due to some uh, slight structure change, uh, we are not sure, but it's, it is something interesting and uh, uh, worth digging into. And how about the infinite layer nucleate? So this year, there are three papers uh, reporting the risk measurement in infinite layer nucleates, finding charge order peak at around a third zero. So it's parallel to the nickel oxygen bonds, similar to cuprates. However, in these papers, there seem to be some sample dependence. So infinite layer nucleates, they are, uh, they are available in form of fumes that you can grow the samples on the STO substrate. And uh, you can grow another other layers of STO on top of the samples as capping layers to uh, pre prevent the samples from maybe deformation. And you can grow, you can also grow sample without capping layers. And the width and without capping layers, the physical properties seem to be quite different. So for example, if you grow the sample without capping layer, you have a strong charge order peak at the third zero but there seem to be no uh, clear magnals. However, if you put the capping layers, you have nice dispersive magnals, but there seem to be no strong charge orders. The, why is it is so different for samples with and without capping layers? We don't know. Maybe some, I would say maybe some uh, structural distortion, or, but, uh, not a hundred percent sure, but anyway, there seem to be some uh, sample dependence for the infinite layer fumes, and the material we studied, the trilayer nucleate for three eight, it is a single crystal, and uh, we have measured the multiple pieces of samples, and the physical properties are quite consistent. The features of the charge order are are easily reproduced. So we are focused on the single crystal sample here. And it's the charge order wave vector is a third a third, so we cannot reach this Q position with oxygen cage. So we will switch to nickel LH instead and then put HHL in the scantling plane. The Rick's measurement we were also performed at the uh, six beam line at NSS2 Brookhaven National Lab. So before before we go to the Rick's measurement, we first check if there is charge modulation. Uh, involved in the charge order. We know that uh, a real charge order should involve the charge modulation. And so if we look at the first panel, the x-axis is a uh, uh, Q along HH direction and the y-axis is an energy loss. And we can see a nice peak at the zero energy loss near the a third a third Q vector. So that's the uh, charge order peak. So it is confirmed that indeed it is a real charge order. It involves the charge modulation. Uh, and uh, at 50K, the signal is still there and 70K uh, is still there and 90K seems to be weaker and 110K it's gone. And we can extract the data to make a line cuts and uh, fit the line cuts and against the temporary dependence of the peak amplitude. And uh, we can see a transition at around 100K uh, consistent with the previous results from the non-remnant uh, measurements. 
then we can switch to the uh, risk management. First, we check the L3 absorption, and we can see a nice peak at the nickel L3H and the L2H with strong diachronism. And the, however, as you can see, the lanthanum M4H is much stronger. And so if you measure at the nickel L3H, there it can strongly distort your data. So in order to get rid of the contamination, we are just focus on the nickel L2H which are far away from the lanthanum uh, M4H. And so here are the, again, the energy maps, the RIGS energy maps for the, at the nickel L2H in sigma and the pi polarization. Uh, so for sigma polarization, it is mainly contributed by dx squared minus y squared orbitals. And uh, for pi polarization, it is mainly distributed by dz squared orbitals. Uh, and this, this information quite important for us to uh, analyze the data. So again, in both channels, we can see multiple features. The diagonal feature is the fluorescence and the low energy strong feature, these are DD excitations. And there are some high energy features. These are charge transfer uh, excitations. Both the charge transfer excitation and the DD excitations should be uh, should resonate at the LH, but for instance, uh, mainly in the post age regime, so it's at a higher incident energy. So to, to compare between these two channels, first we integrate the intensity along the incident energy axis. So we have the high energy uh, featureless continuum, that's the charge transfer and the for instance, and the low energy feature, these are DD excitations. And the fact that the excitations are stronger in the sigma polarization channel uh, indicates that uh, near the Fermi level, the dx squared minus y squared orbitals dominate. That's what we expect, also expect from the extreme absorption. Then the next task would be to distinguish between the charge transfer and the fluorescence. To do so, we uh, we make a cut along the incident energy with the energy loss between 5.5 and 6. So basically make a cut uh, in this area. And so that the charge transfer and for instance will be separated along the incident energy axis. So the left feature is the charge transfer and the right feature is the for instance. And as you can see, the charge transfer excitations are much stronger in the sigma polarization, indicating that uh, the single charge transfer indicates the hybridization between nickel and the oxygen. So, which means here the hybridization between dx square minus y square and oxygen p orbitals are much stronger. However, for the for instance, it is stronger in the pi polarization channel. Uh, so, which means so it's in the post edge region. So, which means the dz square orbitals, the density of state is much larger in the post-edge regime. So the post-edge regime correspond to the unoccupied states above the Fermi level. So which means there are some unoccupied states for the DZ square orbitals, which is, which is kind of unexpected. And we think it is due to the hybridization between the DZ square orbitals and the real earth 5D orbitals. Since the real earth 5D orbitals are mostly unoccupied far above the Fermi level. So now we know the we know the overall electronic structure of this material. So we can uh, continue to the charge order measurement. So we fix the Q, Q uh, we fix at the wave vector of charge order and study its incident energy independence in both the sigma and the pi polarization channels. And we can see that in the sigma polarization channel there is a nice uh, signal resonate at the at the nickel L2H and it's much stronger than that in the pi polarization channel. If you look at the end, the color scale, it's ten times stronger. So this indicates that the uh, charge order in this material is dominated by the contribution from dx square minus y square orbitals and the oxygen p sigma orbitals, and this is similar to cuprates. However, the difference is the signal is 
also available in the polarizing channel, although it's much weaker, but it's not zero. And it resonates slightly pre-age and post-age, but not at the age. And we know that the post-age regime is due to the hybridization between DZ square and the rare earth orbitals. So which means there are some distribution also, although uh, just some minor uh, contributions, but not zero from the DZ square orbitals as well as the rare earth 5D orbitals. And so this is more complex than, than the cuprates. And then next step is to disentangle the contribution from x dx square minus y square orbital and the oxygen p orbitals. To do so, we again use the cluster ED calculations. So here, to since we need to introduce the charge order, so we use uh, three nickel sites instead of two sites. And then we put four holes into this cluster. And if we do nothing, these four holes will be distributed evenly. So to manually introduce a charge order, a charge disproportionation, we introduce a potential difference delta epsilon d by raising the orbital energy for nickel one and nickel three and lowering the orbital energy for nickel two. And uh, as you can expect, naturally, there would be more holes go, uh, going into the nickel two. And then you will have a charge order. Uh, so we also, the uh, the parameters are kept as the same as the uh, oxygen cage risk uh, calculations. So first we check if these parameters are appropriate for this material. So we calculate the energy map in sigma and the pi polarization channels at the nuclear edge and then compare these results with uh, experimental data. So since we have only three sites, so it's a small cluster, so we can only reproduce localized excitations such as the DD excitations. For the for instance, it comes from some continuous uh, states from a band structure. And we know that to realize the band structure, you need a very large lattice. So the fact that we only use three sites, so we cannot reproduce the for instance, but we can reproduce the localized excitations and they are quite consistent with each other indicating that the parameters we use are, uh, are good for this material. So we can go to the charge order calculations. So here is the instant energy dependence of the charge order peak intensity. So with zero uh, potential difference, you expect just some background signals very weak. And with non-zero potential difference, there would be some response from the charge order and of course, with increasing potential difference, the charge order peak would be stronger and stronger. Uh, but as you can see here with different delta epsilon d, the line shape is quite consistent. You have a, a strong peak and a shoulder. So eventually we choose epsilon d uh, equals 0 0.8. So much smaller than the than u and the delta. So the, the electronic structure is not disturbed by the manually introduced uh, potential difference. And uh, here are the final calculation results. So the upper panel is the uh, data and the lower panel is the calculation result. As, and you can see they are quite consistent. And the vertical bars are the, uh, are the contributions from different states to the intermediate states, just uh, showing that we know how the different states interfere with each other to give us the complex profile here. And the inside here give us the whole occupation of different sites. And it turns out that around 70% of the charge modulation uh, happens on the nickel sites and the rest of 30% uh, uh, sits on the oxygen sites. And this is quite different from cuprates. For cuprates, it, the charge order in cuprates is basically bound centered. For example, for the LBCO, it form a pattern like this uh, with the S prime symmetry. And for other uh, cuprates, they're also on the oxygen sides, like YBCO and Bismuth 2201, they form a D symmetry bound centered charge order. And for the trilayer nuclei here, according to our result, it's mostly uh, nickel side centered. Forming a symmetry like 
uh, S symmetry. So this is quite different from cuprates. And we also uh, check the internet energy dependence of the charge order with different charge transfer energy. So to the charge transfer limit and the more hybrid limit. And it turns out that you can see the line shape of the Reynolds behavior is quite sensitive to charge transfer energy. And neither the small delta nor the large delta can uh, describe our data. Only the intermediate value can make a reasonable uh, description. So further confirm that this material is indeed in the mixed charge transfer mode Hubbard region. And so uh, these are conclusions of my talk. So basically we use oxygen cage rigs and to study the electronic structure of the low valence nucleate 438 and find that it is in the mixed charge transfer mode Hubbard region. And uh, then we use nickel LH rigs to study the charge order in 438 and find that uh, it is dominated by hybridized uh, uh, dx square minus y square and oxygen orbitals, which is similar to cuprates. But difference is there are also some contributions from dz square and the rear of 5d orbitals, and that the charge order is mainly nickel side centered instead of bond centered. So these the results give us some uh, some indication about the difference and the similarities of cuprates and the nucleates, and maybe some of the features are crucial for unconventional superconductivity, and the others are not that important. Yeah, that's uh, that's basically my talk. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thanks so much, Yao. Um, do we have uh, questions? Thank you very much for your presentation. I was wondering if uh, you have measured the correlation length of charge density wave in nickelates and if you know how it evolves as a function of temperature. Yeah, that's a very interesting question. So, uh, yeah, so this for this material, I would say the, uh, I would say, this material has a, it is a long range order, but the sample, the mosaic of the sample is not very good. It's like three degree, two degree ish. So I, I think the, we can calculate the correlation length, but it is largely limited by the sample mosaic instead of the real correlation. And we think the real correlation length would be uh, much larger than what we what we can calculate from the data. So it's hard to really extract the temperature dependence of the correlation length. Uh, yeah. Because it is limited by the sample mosaic. Okay, thank you. So um, it's, uh, it is kind of similar to cuprates also, right? If you look at the temperature dependence, uh, regardless of the absolute magnitude, uh, the temperature dependence is kind of similar to uh, cuprates. Uh, yeah. Onset temperature, at least, it's uh, similar to, for example, YDC around 1.8 doping or so. Yeah. No. LSCO, more like LSCO. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your talk. So can you go back to the Rick's spectra when you discuss the valence of, uh, of Nico? Yes, that's probably the one, yes. Okay. So maybe here I didn't get uh, something, but so if I am in a mixed charge transfer case, then yeah. I should expect like higher DD excitations, right? Is that true? Because in the cuprates on the right, the DD excitation seems to be like a bit uh, stronger. To EV, so I was wondering maybe you could comment on that, or maybe I didn't understand something. So for cuprate here, the DD excitation is extremely weak and overwhelmed by these features. So these are uh, oxygen orbital excitations. So oh. you can be, you can barely see any DD excitations. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, for nucleate there are DD excitation, and uh, actually these features are consistent with the results from the nickel age. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you. So thanks for the talk. Um, I have a question. So it seems that in the nickel age, 
you find charge order in the overdose regions. Yes, yeah. That's that's a difference compared to the cuprate system, I imagine. Uh, cuprate. In in many of the cuprate system, like LICO, there are reports of charge order in the overdose regime as well. It's not in the underdope, like it's, I thought it was like more into the, closer to the uh, antiparietic phase. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, so most of the charge order in cuprates are in the underdope regime, but there are some papers find, also find the charge order in the overdope regime. At, the, at least in LCO and uh, Ethmus 201, I didn't remember, but there are charge order in the cuprates in the overdose region as well. And I have a second question. Um, is it possible to apply pressure and see how the, the U and the delta factor varies? Uh, on, on this material, on the trilayer nucleate, it's a single crystal. Uh, I would just say pretty hard since it, this sample is very fragile. Okay. You, you can even break it with a tweezer. Okay, thank but for, you. Yeah, but for the infinite layer films, maybe you can do it with a string. Thank you. Uh, Yao, I have a question uh, regarding the cartoon you showed for the Riggs process in the mixed uh, charge transfer and MOT um, case. Um, and there in the arrows, you you show um, you show a 1s electron being promoted to a 3D shell. So, I mean, this nominally is not a dipole transition. So, is this is this a higher multipolar transition, or is it just because of the hybridization that this occurs? Yeah, it is uh, just due to the hybridization. Okay. So, so here it's. Uh, so here the d and the p orbitals are not the localized one-year orbitals. It's uh, like the eigenstates instead of the atomic orbitals. Yeah. So it's, yeah. So it's, it's dipole transition. Got it. Okay. So then it's the um, it's the uh, the angular momentum component of the superposition that. Uh, that corresponds to the one as to uh, well to the to the um, to the k edge transition. Um, I see. Okay, thanks. We can thank Yao again. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.